I feel like public land as Americans is probably our most valuable asset. We're super blessed in Montana to have millions and millions of acres of public land. These places are special. They have impact on a lot of people's lives and, and it's kind of at the core of what America is. I mean, I just don't think you can beat the rut, you know? It's like, when you hit it, when they're actually bugling, I mean, it's sick. What you just heard or watched is a promo clip from my friends at Montana Wild of their new video called The Outlier. It's a great video and we talk about it a little on today's episode of Gritty Bowman. But the conversation drifts into heavier and more controversial topics as we discuss the subject of game violations, ethics, and poaching. First off, I want to make sure it's very clear that I have tremendous respect for law enforcement agencies and for our fish and wildlife officers across the nation. In fact, some of my closest and dearest friends are police and fish and wildlife officers. Furthermore, I would count these men among the best human beings I know. That said, not all human beings are created equal, and not all law enforcement personnel do a good job. Let me ask you, when confronted by the following situation, what you would do. You're out deer hunting. You see a great 3x3 three three buck and you take a shot at it. The buck runs behind some cover. It disappears for a moment. And then you see him. He's standing just beyond the point where you took the first shot. You take aim and this time you drop him where he's standing. As you walk over to tag your deer, to your utter shock and dismay, you realize you accidentally shot two different deer. You thought they were the same deer, but they weren't. You have broken the law committed a game violation. It was an honest mistake, a complete accident. What do you do? Do you call your state wildlife division and report yourself? Do you tag one of the deer and pretend nothing happened? Do you take both deer so as not to waste the meat but don't report your violation? Then let's say you do report yourself to local wildlife officials. Do they give you a warning and say it was an honest mistake? Or do you get a minimum fine? Or do you get the maximum fine? and lose your hunting privileges for three to five years. We've all heard stories like this that end well and that end badly, depending on how you look at it. In 2013, Montana Wild set out to make a fly fishing film for bull trout in the Bob Marshall wilderness. This decision and subsequent actions would lead to a long and drawn out investigation of Montana Wild and would result in a series of game violations that would eventually be settled outside of court. There's always two sides to every story. I'm fully aware of this. On this episode of Gritty Bowman, we talk about the Montana wild side of this story, something that Zach and Travis Bouton, the owners of Montana Wild, have not hitherto publicly discussed in a forum like this. I applaud them for doing this podcast with me. A close friend of mine asked me why I would do this podcast with Zach and Travis. Why would I talk about this subject? Why not just stick to a discussion about their awesome new video, The Outliers, and leave it at that? First of all, I don't like ignoring the elephant in the room. It feels fake to me. The entire time we talk about the new video, there will be people out there calling them poachers under their breath. And that's another reason I wanted to talk about this. It bothers me the way individuals hang people out to dry for poaching allegations before any convictions are made. 
What happened to two sides to every story or innocent until proven guilty or let him without fault cast the first stone? And it annoys me the way people blow violations out of proportions. The way some people act, you'd think that someone who shot a squirrel out of season is the equivalent of a child rapist. We just should keep things in perspective. The thing is, I appreciate the sincere effort and skill that goes into the production of Montana Wild Films. I truly feel, whether they made mistakes or not, that they have a sincere love of the outdoors and a passion for presenting a positive message about hunting to the world at large. You can see it in their films. And frankly, I feel a responsibility to share their side of the story because I'm not perfect. Aaron Snyder isn't perfect. We've done stupid and ignorant things, and I'd like to think that someone would give me the chance to share my story if the roles were reversed. And I think that's an important discussion to have. If I'm being completely and totally honest, I harbor a natural wariness and a minor lack of trust for law enforcement personnel that I don't personally know. And it's not because I'm guilty. It's primarily due to the imbalance of power. I think it's good to talk about these things. In the end, I want there to be trust and respect between fish and wildlife personnel, law enforcement, and hunters at large. I never want to see an us versus them mentality at play. I want to see mutual trust, shared goals, and genuine appreciation between all of us. So take a listen to this podcast and let me know what you think. And if you're interested and want to see some good elk hunting film, Go and buy Montana Wild's new video, The Outliers. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Bowman Podcast. This is not take two. Uh, we're at Big Sky, Montana at the Total Archery Challenge event. I've got the Montana Wild brothers here with me, uh, Travis and Zach Bouton. Bouton. B-O-U-G-H? Yep. T-O-N? Yes. Bouton. What is that? Stuck like it. French or? It's like French and English. Yeah. Really? A little German. Bouton. Used to be button. (laughs) Well, it used to be Bouton. Supposedly we were button makers. All right. Not very glamorous. I would stick with (laughs) Bouton. Yeah. Bouton sounds just a little too. It's kind of. It's a little frou frou. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so that's good. I mean, we're giving everybody ammo straight off the bat. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. They start calling us out when they see us. See. That's okay. Uh, I've been following you guys for a while. I've seen your stuff pop up on social media and your film and, and I've been following that. And then a couple of years ago, I really got to know Zach Griffith a little more. Yep. And, uh, as we, we spoke, he talked about how, um, you guys were just producing some very cinematic and, and, and like real footage and, and film that he really at the time liked. And this was years ago. Uh, and uh, wasn't seeing a lot of footage like that, and it really yeah. inspired him to get out and and step up his game and really do something that's different from a lot of what the the mainstream hunting industry had been doing. Yeah, and so uh, I started to look a little more into what you guys were doing because of of what I what what Zach said and and uh, found some really beautiful footage that you guys put together. So. Thanks. Um, the other week, last week we were at, I was at the total archery challenge in snowbird and Travis hooked me up with your new DVD or digital download. Uh, Either you hand me the DVD and I was like, DVD. <laughs> you're like, I was like, dude, I know you're old school. <laughs> Take this. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you, you kind of sit there for a minute and I'm like, yeah, I do. I do have a DVD player. I mean, uh, cause some people don't. We no don't. More. I figured you'd probably remember to watch if I gave you that, and then you'd be like, "Hey, I don't got a DVD player, dude." <laughs> dude, it was the digital. It's funny because uh, my my kids, you you buy all these DVDs when they're kid. My my oldest is like fourteen, and now you have like a whole collection of kids DVDs, and my youngest is seven, and so they're still watching all those films. You can't get rid of the DVD player. No. But uh, we rarely actually turn it on. I had to go find the cords for it and try to find a way to, like, get it to run. <laughs> and then... Uh, I bet the kids are stoked. Like, and, the DVD player's yeah. back up! <laughs> and you know what I actually... Watch all the films. I, I actually did. I, 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 sw- I, I, I got to watch some of it, but I, I hated watching it on the TV. And I knew I was on the road here. I swung by uh, uh, Best Buy, and I got a DVD disc ray player thing okay. for my laptop nice. slapped it on there and boom boom i was i was i was in the money sweet so i watched it a couple times actually and uh 
the film, the DVD is called The Outlier. Yep. And what season is this? It was two hunting seasons ago, so it was yeah. 2015? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. 2015. And then we had um, hunted it a few years prior. Like mm-hmm. our film Ambush 2, our buddy Tyler shot a bull out there. And that was 2012. That was just Ambush. Oh, yeah. That was just Ambush. The first one, yeah. And then 2013, Travis and I went back out there and we hunted and both shot bulls. We uh, were shooting a film for Mystery Ranch, mm-hmm. which is the pack out. Which we show people how to pack an elk out. Yeah. And after that season, we got to talking to a couple of my buddies, Josh and Brandon. Mm-hmm. And they had both like we, I, at the time I didn't know they were hunting out there. Yeah. But after the season, it was like, yeah, we're hunting the breaks too. And like we were in the same area and like all four of us had shot bulls with the bows. Yeah. I was like, that's kind of a rarity as far as the numbers go. Right. I could be sick if we all four of us could go back and mm-hmm. lay that down on film. And so that kind of spawned the film from the beginning. And so we just planned it out. And... I, I want to get into this film. Uh, before we do that, I want I want you to tell folks a little bit about, you know, anyone who doesn't know who you guys are. Tell me a little bit about uh, who you are and what Montana Wild is. So Montana Wild, it's basically, I mean, we're a media company, mm-hmm. but we're also a brand. So, you know, we do a lot of film and photography work, social media marketing stuff, and then we also sell apparel. Yeah. So that's kind of like our, our business as a whole. It's fairly diverse for just the two of us um, doing everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, started in 2011. 11, just as a blog. As a blog. And it was just, we didn't actually grow up hunting and fishing. We uh, Really? Yeah. We didn't actually start hunting and fishing till 2010. What? Yeah. Well, it's been like eight or nine years now, so whatever that <laughs> somewhere right okay, around wait a goes minute. back to. Okay, how did you get into hunting and fishing? Um, <laughs> this is we'll try to keep it short. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Uh, anyways, we grew up in North Idaho. Okay, uh, my no one in our family hunted or, like Coeur d'Alene or yeah, yeah. the Coeur d'Alene area. Mm-hmm. And our dad, he took us, you know, like bass fishing, pike fishing a couple times and actually took us fly fishing one time at the time we were like, dude, this is dad, this is for old men. <laughs> oh, Not yeah. to mention like, I don't even know how I'm ever going to catch a fish because you don't know what I, you're doing. I don't know well, what I'm doing. And I think that trip, like you actually, didn't you hook a fish or catch a fish before I, I cut my leg open? Really? It was, um, I think it was on the Coeur d'Alene River mm-hmm. and there's a, there's, if I remember correctly, the highway was right there yeah. and either a, a big sheet of tin or steel or whatever <laughs> had, you know, ripped off of something yeah, yeah. during runoff or flew off a truck and it was laying on the bank and I just like hopped over it as a kid and I caught right here this scar, oh, like wow. my leg. That's a legit on scar. On the edge of it. And like, yeah. you know, a minute later I'm like, it feels warm down there. I like look down and like, <laughs> you can see the fat in my leg looks <laughs> bleeding. And so camping, fishing trip ruined, you know, we hopped in the truck and dad Otherwise Travis would have caught a real fish. Otherwise, yeah. we might have been hooked there. <laughs> but no, I mean, yeah, we thought it was just for old men. And and none of our buddies really hunted that we were friends with. In so the you area. really didn't hunt as a, then. And yeah, so we never hunted Fast back forward. Then. Uh, so then our f- Zach ended up coming actually to school here in Bozeman. Mm-hmm. Yep. Before our family the next year actually ended up moving? transplanting and moving to uh, the Flathead Valley. Oh really? And yeah. so that's when I moved with them. That was my senior year of high school. And uh what an awesome place. Yeah. It was kind of around that time. How could you live there and not like get into hunting and fishing? Oh yeah, yeah. like our cabin and then our, our home like backed up to forest service land. Yeah. And I don't know, there just was some different like vibe when you drive from Idaho over to Montana. Like you had to turn on like some country <laughs> music and <laughs> you know, it was cool well, to drive a diesel and <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's different. So I just wanted to just go deer hunt. Like I, I don't know, I, yeah, some natural attraction to do it. And I walked around with a rifle a couple times behind. <clears throat> yeah. And house. growing up, fortunately, like our dad, he shot guns all the time. Okay. So like we had a ton of knowledge as far as shooting rifles and handguns and stuff hunted. growing up, just mm-hmm. didn't hunt. We used them to shoot or, you know, personal self-defense. But then, yeah, 
So you started was, hunting, and then you start the blog a year after you first like go hunting. Two, yeah. it, was, it was a year or two. I don't it know. It was like a year and... Regardless, it was so, close. Right, a yeah, year and a half or so. Long story short, we went... We, Travis met a guy named Tyler McCann, who we're good friends with, and he had a ranch out on the High Line, mm -hmm. out by the Caver. And so that that fall, our first real hunting season, he invited us out there, and we had a hoot, and just, you know, it's a target rich environment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the next spring, summer, I was living in Missoula. Travis was living in Missoula. And I kept hearing about Rock Creek, this world famous fly fishing thing. And I was like, I probably need to figure out what this is if we have world class <laughs> fly fishing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And just from there, I mean, you go out and you fish and have the right people in the right mindset. It's hard to stop or not like it. Yeah. So, yeah. And so it, it's, yeah way more people like every single person you meet or have a common interest with or like become friends with they're like are you going fishing or are you going hunting this year right. like what are you going and so it's just like it was super easy to like find people to like give you knowledge and to like go out and just start mm -hmm. hunting and fishing and we were instantly hooked from there so you get into the this and you start the blog and how does that turn into film and stuff like that um before this, we skied a lot. Like I actually worked up here at Moonlight Basin and, and over at the Yellowstone Club just briefly. Mm -hmm. And so, like I, for a few years there, I was skiing like a hundred days a year, and Travis was skiing a lot as well. Yeah. And so we were consuming, you know, like young dudes. We're watching a lot of like ski film and like the online presence of content and media was huge, right? And so when you start fishing and hunting, you're like. We this is just how we do it when we go skiing. Like, where where do we go watch the sweet fishing films and the sweet hunting films? And we couldn't find it. Yeah, I was going to say. So, because so, here's the deal. You guys really depart from, at the time, what mainstream hunting footage looked like mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. I mean, you had stuff ranging from, <clears throat> you know, Bone Collector and and. and, and key, Waddell and that kind of stuff to, to like Primos where it's like, uh, 25 elk kills, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and, 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 and there's a little bit, but they're call-ins and a shot, calling and a shot, calling. And it seemed like everybody kind of did the same model, right? Mm -hmm. And to make a hunting film, you needed to be able to call in, you need to have a few elk shot on film. And that was the film. Mm -hmm. There yep. was no film around <clears throat> getting to the wilderness or into the in the back country there there wasn't a lot of cinematography really it was just yeah. flat out just camera yep action it was like hey are we going to get a kill otherwise this isn't happening <laughs> and there's no video to yeah. really yeah. you know there was it was cool cuz there's a lot of close up footage of elk you get mm -hmm. to see as they're screaming in that most climactic moment but it really wasn't a film a film per se no so you guys are so I, I find it interesting because you're not you. It, it sounds like you weren't really influenced being out of the hunting world. You weren't really influenced by any of the traditional content. So then when you go to look for footage, you're looking for. You're like, hey, this stuff doesn't really match what we want to see. No, no, there's like nothing. Well, with skiing, it's always like you watch films to get stoked for the season, mm -hmm. gets you all jacked up, and then you go skiing. And for fishing and even hunting, it was like, like what, there's nothing out here that gets you <laughs> stoked to go like hunting. I mean, there's stuff, but like very few things that actually get you excited to go out and um, go hunting or fishing for the year, especially on the fly fishing side. I mean, it was super classical music and like banjos. <laughs> Not to say there's nothing wrong with banjos. Like old dudes. And then everybody, you know, with just like, it just was older people fishing. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't exciting for like, the younger crowd which for us we were like dude fly fishing so like rad yeah like, well yeah it was a hip and cool it and was a perfect like scenario for us because we i mean growing up really golfing and skiing you're in a very controlled environment yeah where you start hunting and fishing and you're like dude this is like endless like we can just go explore and rage around and and so i think we wanted to share that part of it because we thought it was so cool yeah like catching the fish and going out and hunting was great it's funny because on the fly fishing scene, you have, you really, the fly fishing tour is yeah. relatively yeah. new. You know, these film tours that that have been going around. And and that's where I started to first see some really cool 
mm-hmm. fly fishing, like outdoor hunting and outdoor footage, fishing footage, right? Before that, it just, it was like some old dudes who wrote books on how to tie flies and um, yeah. you just didn't have the, uh, it wasn't, didn't resonate with me yeah. the same way. Yeah, like if someone wanted to come talk to us about fishing and like the legendary fly tires and like it, I wouldn't <laughs> wow. know any of it. You yeah. know, like, and some people would think that that's sad, but it's just the way that we've came into the sport and what's resonated with us just hasn't been that. You know, yeah. we just want to go out, and do it, and have a good time. So, uh, so you took your, your kind of skiing, snowboarding, you know, idea of filmmaking and brought it into fishing yeah so all of our inspiration was i mean a lot of it the beginning was from ski snowboard films any of like the action sports stuff and we still that's where we get a lot of inspiration Mm -hmm. um just because there wasn't really much that got us inspired in the fishing and hunting so tell me this right now like today what uh outdoor uh, films do resonate with you. I mean, Donnie Vincent, I say is for sure. I yeah. mean, top dog as far as like inspirational content or one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of, uh, filmmakers that do some of the Yeti films like Taweg mm-hmm. creative does some really awesome stuff. Um, last night's film, the linguist. Yep. Yeah. That Can't was awesome. Does that some was really great good. work. The there's line. a lot of just like bits and pieces here. I don't think mm-hmm. there's like one crew or one group of yeah. people that like just is always like, whoa. You know, yeah. like there's just parts I think you like just about. just like pick and choose things that you like. Yeah, I'd know? say I like Donnie, Vincent. Uh, I wish he just <coughs> made more videos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, to, or he has them, but their dust is collecting on them. <laughs> uh, rumor is there's a new one coming out soon. Nice. I think it's long, too. Like, And that's my thing, too. I'm like, make the make it whatever length it needs to be to tell the story. If it's, yeah. if it's 20 minutes, great. If it's an hour and a half, great. I mean, just let it breathe. Let it be what it is. Yeah. Uh, you're not making it for TV. It doesn't have to be 22 mm-hmm. minutes exactly. You know, that kind of thing. I, I like that. Um I don't have a thing. It's like with podcasts. The, as long as the conversation is thriving and it's and it's rolling, I I don't really feel the need to. So some go an hour and then we're done. Yeah. Some go three hours. Yeah. It, it just it depends on that conversation. So I prefer to let a film run its course the same way. Yeah. Um, and it's it's tricky because you want it to be, you know, cherry picked to have just the best of the best. But then, and I'm no. I play at making film, you know what I mean? So Yeah, but I mean you're the one you're you're the most important opinion, you know, as the viewer. Cuz yeah. just the, the viewers don't make films either, and they're the people that you want the film to connect with. Yeah, and I feel like at the end of the day, uh I've said this about everything. Um it's really about doing what I want to do mm-hmm. and make making uh films that I want my kids and my grandkids and friends to to see and be inspired by and I feel like if if I'm doing that uh and people and a whole bunch of other people like it then I win Mm -hmm. but if they don't I still win yeah Yeah. and it's and you can get you can get really messed up I think trying to copy or imitate or do something that's just not you oh absolutely I mean first and foremost you should be stoked on what you're creating like mm-hmm. your idea like if you think that's awesome like go with it yeah if you let other people's opinion like outside opinion change what you're doing and you're like your mindset on how you want to create a film yeah i think you kind of lose like the power of like your filmmaking ability like your personal yeah. filmmaking ability i agree yeah if you're not failing a few times making films you're not doing it right <laughs> yeah. you you're not fail. learning anything <laughs> <laughs> so when you guys uh, go from basically filming or from you, you jump into this thing and start filming, you know, I'm looking at your footage on this new film, this new DVD, The Outlier, and uh, you guys slay some, you know, you guys kill some bulls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the question is, um, so 2011, it hasn't been that long. How, how 
Is it just that you live in an epic place, or are you guys just like killers? No, we're not, <laughs> no, we're not killers. I mean, for like the general time that we've hunted, I think we've done well. Uh-huh. I wouldn't say we're killers. Um, I think it's just. I know it was for kinda me, I'm, I'm not a killer. I just put in the time. Yeah, like exactly. I, like I always tell people, if you're going to hunt, my odds of killing something if I hunt 14 days are astronomically higher than if I hunt seven. Oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> well, and it was just, we were so excited and passionate about hunting and fishing mm-hmm. when we started getting into it that every single free minute or afternoon or morning that yeah. we had was spent either researching uh-huh. or time in the field. And when you spend, I mean, it's just like anything. If you practice and spend time in the field and gain knowledge, and that's all you do, yeah. I mean, you're going to get good at it quick or at least learn and, I mean, make mistakes right. quickly, learn yeah. from those mistakes, and then just progress from there. And I think that's what we've done. And then just Zach and I being brothers and bouncing knowledge off each other. Like, yeah, dude, I went out hunting today. My wind, it was weird. It was like on my neck blowing towards the elk and he just like, he didn't look at me, but he booked it. I have no idea like what happened. And Zach, you know, being like, dude, he smelled you. <laughs> oh, like elk, elk can smell like humans and they're scared of that. Just like, you know, wow. things like that. We were like, you're an idiot. But like, all right, I know now like something and I'm going to move on from that. But it's, right, you build on it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's cool just because. I mean, we're nothing special. We just worked really hard and had a passion for it. Mm-hmm. And it's like anybody, whether even the filmmaking stuff. <clears throat> I mean, I took a year of film school. Did and you? And that was it. And yeah. we made like two 15 second films that year. Yeah. You know? And like, we just grew up mobbing around the mountain with our dad's little camcorder, like, we're mm-hmm. making a ski film. <laughs> you know, like 14 and like 16 yeah. years old. And you can just learn so much. We actually, I guess we had a, uh, uh, video class in high school mm-hmm. where our teacher gave, well, well, taught us quite a bit of the basics but i would say that you when you watch this mm-hmm. right here you're, you're you're looking you're looking at something that's better than your your normal hunting films especially in the cinematography department in the uh and then i thought you know your your color scale and all that kind of stuff was it was cool yeah, and it, it, it really right. clean, mm-hmm. like professional. Yeah. Like for me, you get like this raw GoPro footage slapped in top of like some kind of, uh, <laughs> yours is way too pretty for that. Well, yeah. <laughs> There's too much pain <laughs> carrying the big camera around to, <laughs> to slap in the GoPro footage. <laughs> uh, but, but it's, it's beautiful. So, um, and then I know from personal experience that just filming, having someone towed along behind you while you're trying to get something on film is, is a, it's tough mm-hmm. and yeah. getting a shot on film and everything, it's really difficult and you guys achieve that. But then uh, in addition to that, then you're able to actually produce it and producing something is so difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it takes so much time. How long did it take you to put this out? Too much time. Yeah, because I mean, where's 2016 and 2017? Uh, so, well, because this, this is 2015. Well, well so. I mean that can that can lead into a, a further conversation, <laughs> but the stuff we were talking about earlier kind of delayed that film. Okay, yeah, a it was bit. supposed to be out last year, mm-hmm. but it okay. got put on the back burner, which was fine because we weren't we in a great position to us more hammer time. that out. But I mean, it's really, I spent like 40 days in the breaks that year between mm -hmm. hunting and filming. And then over the last two years on and off, we've been working on editing it. I mean, I bet it was three good months of working on that a majority of the time to get edited. And then, you know, I mean, it's not terribly difficult to make a DVD, but to teach yourself, you know, how to export your hour and 17 minute long Mm -hmm. film in the best quality, build out a DVD menu, yeah, burn it so that when you go order a thousand or five thousand or however many thousands of copies, when those show up, they play in people's DVD players yeah. and like designing play covers and yes, it, it played. <laughs> but that that's the thing. Um, it, you guys can still do. So I did like VHX downloads. You can do mm-hmm. Vimeo. Um, 
where I just put it up for digital download. Yeah. And, um, but it is not that easy to, to do all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then even people, I always help people, uh, start a podcast. You know, I really want to help people get going on if they call me and say, Hey, I want to, I want to do a podcast. Um, but it's not that easy to, I mean, just figuring out how to get it published to iTunes is a whole challenge, yeah. yep. you know? So, uh, hats off to you. So on this DVD here, um, what was the most for you guys? What is the most, uh, like, I don't know. Not, I don't want to use the word epic, but you know, like the most, uh, amazing moment for you guys on this. I'll go f like as far as from the hunt or just the whole the whole thing process. Yeah. I mean the most epic was just to have done it. Yeah. And have it like turn out. You know? <laughs> oh dude, I know to, what like, you mean. Plan yeah. it. You're like, like Whoa, this, this is what we're gonna do. And then to see the final product, like, okay, we like I we succeeded in I think coming as close as we could to what I had, we had envisioned mm -hmm. in the beginning and you know, three of us filling our tags yeah and capturing most of those moments well and then to actually put the whole thing together and have it released and everything works and have positive feedback it's, i'd say that's the best part from the from the actual hunt i think when josh shot his bull with zach mm -hmm. and uh he was actually having knee problems mm -hmm. we didn't really show too much of it and capture it, but he was having like knee issues. Unfortunately he shot on the first day and that was when Zach and Zach got a hold of me. We were back in Missoula mm -hmm. over five hours away. I was like, yo, we just shot a bull. I don't know if Josh is going to be able to pack this out cause we're nine miles in. <laughs> and we were, I was like, okay, we'll be like, I'm leaving <laughs> here in like 30 minutes. Everything will be in the truck and we're going to drive through the night and we'll be there at first thing in the morning. Yeah. And so Jay and myself drove through the whole night got there and then it was just awesome to have like a team of people like just come together and pack the bull out and make it just before this rainstorm just yeah. loaded the brakes with gumbo and so yeah. that was, yeah. so it was it was a pretty uh, uh one of the parts that that I really liked um was when you snuck up on your bull and shot it down in the when it was it was like bedded down there yep um tell me a little bit about that so that was a bull I saw first thing in the morning and cause you guys were talking in the morning, where do you go? Where do you go? And I'm, I'm going to go over here yeah. and the then you go and slay a bull. <laughs> the funny thing was, is Brandon and I spotted that same bull, but not before Travis had. <laughs> yeah. We're like on opposite ridges. We can look in the same coulee, but then on the other side into different coulees. And we were watching actually the same bull and he was, the one that was kind of most fired up and had ripped some bugles and that's yeah. how we found them. And, uh, the bull went and bedded on the hillside where we could actually see, see him, him see his location, yeah. which doesn't really happen super often in the breaks. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we waited for the thermals to, you know, Settle. midday to kind of, you know, get some fairly like consistent thermals. Uh -huh. And then we did a huge loop. I actually almost shot a bull on the way to in that stock but it happened so quick that we like the footage was we, it's just too much time you know to, like mm -hmm. sidetrack people um but i had a bull at, like 40 yards that i ended up passing on just like a smaller six mm -hmm. on this on my route to go stop well, that's this ballsy bull. yeah <laughs> and then he's just too small well it was <laughs> day one it was, yeah it's day one i was like okay it's, that can bite but you. stick with the plan it's gonna be it just makes more sense that can bite you in the butt sometimes yeah but anyways, we got up there and <laughs> we always try to make it to like a hundred yards or somewhere right around there and get in your socks, mm -hmm. stock. I mean, it's just quiet. You're a ninja and try not to step on cactus. And we snuck in. Fortunately, I picked good landmarks and got on a cliff where I could see his horns down there and he was bedded and I didn't have a shot. Mm -hmm. And that's where we just waited until he finally, he stood up. I don't know if he smelled us or what mm -hmm. drew and, put an arrow in him. He was quartering harder than how far was the shot? 23 yards. Okay. Or maybe it was 27. I can't remember. Yeah. Somewhere inside 30. And then, um, 
he went and <clears throat> I stopped him again. And actually, I you got that other arrow. I knocked the the arrow. It <laughs> took me longer than it should have. I should have had a perfectly broadside <laughs> shot, but when in the moment, I knocked it outside my D loop. Right, and right. so I had to re knock it. <laughs> and then by the time it was just like you know, put another arrow in him, <clears> shot another arrow, basically up through his hind quarter, mm-hmm. and then crashed down the hill. Super loud crash. I saw the other bull that he was bedded with leave over the ridge. He never came out. So it's like, down. I got two arrows in. I'm like, yeah, he should be dead. Um, but I was shooting expandable. I think with like the hard angle, I didn't get good penetration. Yeah. And just it's like the angle I should have actually been a little bit higher because mm-hmm. it was so much downhill. Yeah. And we waited and it was kind of like, dude, I think he's dead. Went down. Wasn't dead, bumped him. But you he guys runs. only waited. I was sitting there watching it going, because uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Brandon. Brandon. Yeah. One, one of them said, well, it's been an hour. Yeah. Oh, he's Let's dead. go. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, no, don't go look for it. No. I'm like, wait four hours. You know, like a liver shot, you know, it could take four yeah. hours for him to judge. Just be safe. Just leave him there for four or five hours and then go. Because even even if he's not dead, by then he'll stove up so much that maybe he won't even have the heart to get up and move or it'll be that much weaker. Yeah. But in an hour, that's where I'm always like, I'm always grabbing Aaron Snyder and being like, Aaron, look over there. Aaron, because I'm trying to <laughs> stall him. Down. Anything like, well. what do you think about this, Aaron? Oh, come over here. Anything I, because he is like, the second he shoots it, he wants to go after it. And I, it's like trying to hold back the ocean. Mm-hmm. And we... Almost every time he ends up bumping it and it runs and it's this chase. And I'm like, Aaron, <laughs> it always ends badly. Let's just. So I was watching that and I'm like, only. And I saw the shot. I saw where it went in. I think I was thinking to myself, don't do it. And then, and then you guys went and looked for it. And then it sounded like, you know, you, you, you bumped him a little bit. And yeah. then. Yeah. And we should have, like, yeah, absolutely. Like we should have. If I would have waited four hours, he would have been dead. Right there. Cause I, so I bumped him. We followed blood and we're just going slow. Cause mm-hmm. we're just trying to be like super sneaky. And if we do come up on him, get another shot. Right. And it just got to the point where we followed him. I'd shot him like slightly into the afternoon. It was going to be getting dark. There was one last patch of trees that we felt like with the way that the blood was going that he probably bedded in. And it was just like, dude, if we bump from here, he can, he's pretty, like he can kind of go anywhere. And here's and the issue with that is. Him. At some point, they kind of stop bleeding often because yeah. mm-hmm. they, they clot up or whatever. It doesn't mean they're not still bleeding internally, but it, the blood's not coming out or you shoot them high like you did. The exit hole's up, way up top, so it just doesn't come out the same way as, as if it was a low shot. And then you bump them like that, and <clears throat> they're even though he's dead on his feet, like you have hit him with a fatal shot, and he doesn't know it yet, but he's dead. Yeah. He's still alive for three hours, and a dead bull on his feet can still travel miles, Mm -hmm. even though he's dying. And once that happens with no blood, it's over when probably wouldn't move if you just gave him time. Yeah. Yeah. When at that point after bumming, we were like, okay, he's got to be somewhere in the trees. Let's just play it smart now. But we had to actually go the direction where we thought he was yeah. to get back to camp. So we're like, kind we're going cro- to have to like cross over to the adjacent coulee to try That's to. That's like an Aaron excuse to get to a like, little closer. <laughs> no, the bull actually like he diagonally went down the hill, but then he like backtracked. Oh, did he? Yeah. So, so on the way, like trying to avoid him and not bump him, he's actually over in the adjacent oh, coulee. Wow. We, and we didn't get footage of that, but he bumped him. He sprinted up the hill. I sprinted after him. Couldn't figure out where he went. Couldn't see any blood. It's getting dark. Oh. And it was actually, it's funny because then we went back to camp and that bull was literally like 30 yards from where I last was standing in the timber. Well, when we when came the next found day. Day. When we the came next and day. found him the next day. Oh, so he just so like death went, marched. Yeah. He got over the top and, and then it was expired. Yeah. We thought Lucky, it was a diff- dude. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. We weren't sure if it, when Travis bumped him hiking out we weren't sure if it was his bowl or just a, a dip, bowl yeah because yeah. it was through like a bunch of junipers yeah so when we came back in the morning we just went back to the blood trail. dude how relieved were oh. you because it was just it was just i mean it's the worst thing <coughs> in the world when you think you might not be able to find an animal you shot yeah and then to like be working on a film and like 
it's part of the story and just you. not, it was not the, like the foot we really wanted to start the whole project <laughs> on. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was a huge relief to be like, okay, like we're going to be know, able to get this bowl. We just did a podcast with breadcrumb tech, mm -hmm. uh, about their, their Bluetooth knock with Brandon Bates and mm -hmm. stuff. And, you know, we're still kind of, we're, I, I just, it was really cool to, to talk about that and how, what a game changer that can be in that recovery area. And, and really it's all about the animal, yeah. you know, and it's suffering, find it. It's, it's really about the animal. And so when you're out there <clears throat> looking for it, I could, it, to me, you know, where your arrow is still out, you could track that bull. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, for you know, sure I mean, it, it works like, I think within a hundred yards is, is as far as it works. And now if the arrow snapped off, did it snap off at some point? No, they're both fully intact. And yeah. You know. I mean, that's a game changer, dude. Cause you get there and you're, you get to where you shot him from and you turn it on and he's within a hundred yards. He's like, Hey, he's, he's still there. You could just, it just feels good knowing where he's at and yeah. then just, mm -hmm. well, let's just wait, you know? And then if he moves, you know, he moved. You're like, whoa, we need to give him some time. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. uh, I think it's brilliant technology. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's good. What do you, what, how do you guys feel about that? I think it has its benefits. It has its pros and cons. Yeah. It used right. It's, it's only good technology. Well, that's my thing though. To me, it's like, if someone wants to abuse that, they're probably going to abuse other stuff. Yeah. Anyways. It's, it's like saying we should take guns away because yeah. someone might use them irresponsibly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I think that, you know, people are going to, that's not the goal is to use it irresponsibly. And, uh, and it's it, it, someone who's going to do that. They're going to do all kinds of things irresponsibly. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, there's so many products out there that can be used the wrong way. Yeah. For like, I, so for me, and again, like Aaron said the other day, he's like, you shoot an elk in the ass with a, with a Bluetooth so you can track it. Yeah. Well, once it's a hundred yards away, yeah. you can't track it anymore. It's not, it doesn't work like that. And it can travel like 10 miles with an arrow in its butt. It's got so. a GPS <laughs> in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not really a GPS, no, right? No, I know. I'm saying but you know what if I mean? you did, you'd be like, ah, I got Well, it. they have that, <laughs> that other product that is like a GPS that deposits a, you know, it's got some kind of hook or whatever, and it deposits an actual. That, yeah. Well, that's like you could be at home and you can still track it. That, yeah. to me, is like crossing a line. Yeah, that's you know? pushing it there. Um, sure. But, uh, yeah, I feel like... Uh, that that's cool. So so you 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 track that bull, you recover it, feels good. Now, one of the other sh parts that stood out to me was um uh what I thought was one of the coolest parts for me was toward the end. <clears throat> it's late, you guys it's later in the season, you know, you're still out there with bow and arrow and in the meadow there uh is it Brandon does some calls? Yeah. yeah. There's a few cow calls and this bull just comes trotting out. And it's like, that's like the moment where my heart rate just starts going, you know, it's like, yes. Yeah. And then the bull walks right in range. Right. And I'm wondering why he's not shooting it when it's further out in the meadow. Like, shoot, dude, <laughs> shoot. And I don't know the yardages because on yeah. film, it can all be yeah. a little tricky. Sure. Right. And then that bull walks right by and broadside. And that bull was just looking for something. He was he was he was peppy and like it was cool to watch just his body. He ate a little grass, but he was like kind of <laughs> kind of. He was like, looking for cows. He was looking yeah. right, and 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 he comes by. <clears throat> but what? But I'm like I'm dying here. Like shoot, when are you gonna shoot? And I don't want to give it away, but um, but I'm going to a little bit. So That's he, okay. <laughs> he 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 shoots that shot while the bull's still on the walk. Yeah, and uh, and. And I've seen that done. I've, you know, I haven't actually done it, tried it. I've seen Aaron do it. Uh, and it, sometimes, you know, if you're familiar with that, it can work. But so often that's, that shot's too far back because yeah. one step is like three feet yeah. with an elk. And, and you're, so you're never shooting, tracking. No, not with an, not that. with a compound. Mm -hmm. It just, you could do that with a recurve and it sort of just instinctively, yeah. You, you kind of follow and it's and like if you're it. throwing a ball to someone who's running, you know, it's, it's just a more natural thing. Right. Exactly. But with a compound, it often I see the shot go too far back yeah. just because it's, it's that way. So, 
uh, when he shoots, I was like, oh, no, because I expected him to cow call, freeze, yeah. drill yeah. it, yeah. right? So what went through his mind when that happened? I think he – I mean, I, it's hard to speak for Brandon, but, I mean, we know him well enough where he was confident he was just going to kill it on his feet yeah. walking by. And, and he would say now that it, it was a bad judgment call. He should have just cow called, stopped it, and smoked it. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like – he was probably kind of feeling the pressure and like, this is an op- awesome opportunity. Like mm-hmm. not really like thinking through clearly mm-hmm. what that happens so often when you're in the moment and just being like opportunity. He's in within range. He's broadside. Yeah. He's I got trotting. This. Mm-hmm. It's, it's happening. Boom. When it should have been like, what's the typical, come on, we've done this a million times. Yeah. Cow call, get them to stop. Settle your pin. And, you know, well, and, <laughs> and so often it works too, yeah. because when you sit there and you go, you know, and I've done this before. I shot one bull on the walk and he was only like 13 yards mm-hmm. from me. And, uh, and the shot was way back. And I thought it was so close. And I had cows on this, on the back side of me and in front of me. And they were just going through and I had got to full draw. And I was just sitting there while the cows were all walking by. And I was just in a clump kind of waiting. And that bull, Finally, he comes by, and I'm right there, and I, I cow called, mew, cow called, mew, mew. <laughs> well, I was surrounded by cows yeah, doing the same right. <laughs> sound. He didn't even, like, he didn't slow down at all, and he was kind of, like, all jacked up. And, uh, and and I panicked, pulled that shot forward, and, uh, and shot because he w- didn't stop for me when I thought he would. And uh, since then, I've learned it's got to be, like, a super urgent cow call. Oh yeah. Uh, it's like, gotta be like, yeah. And then they stop and they're what? And, and yeah. then you got that pause where you got that shot. Yeah. And I, I practice that now. I'm it's, like, it's gotta, it's gotta be real nasty. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> like when I, I mean, I stopped Josh's bull in the film and it was just like, Nyeh! that's right. <laughs> it was like, what? Yep. Is, are we, what, should we leave that cow? There? <laughs> <Is> it, <laughs> or, <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. Uh, and, and that was a cool, cool deal because i think i heard you guys say uh when you guys were like he was like i love you i love you man, I love you, man. I'm so, like he's so glad you stopped that thing because uh otherwise he was out you could tell the body language that thing oh, yeah. was gonna ditch yeah uh but um but that was cool but one of the things that 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 happened when you when you when you got that on film the the brandon's bull um you know it, it went a little far back and it took a while to recover it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you guys uh, kept that in the film. Yeah. And talked about it a little bit and, and, and showed that. And uh, it's always this this thing between outdoor, you know, hunting film dudes, you know, do we leave that in? Do we take it out? Mm-hmm. What's the appropriate protocol here? Because yeah. you're showing something that's the, the kind of the un- unattractive side of of hunting, the brutality of what it really is at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, what went into that thought process for you guys? It's just, it's reality. We're all human. Like, especially for us, like we're just ordinary guys. Like it definitely happens. And f- hopefully it showed that like, it was a learning experience for us. Like mm-hmm. it was definitely probably like the hardest thing to sit there and be like, the bull's not dead yet. So, uh, a little bit ago, um, Aaron got in trouble for, for poaching squirrels. Did you guys know that? No, I hadn't heard it yet. Which, yeah. You know, yeah, it's surprising. I mean, and nowadays. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal but when you, when you poach. I'm going to send some emails <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we get off I'm gonna, the podcast. I'm going to make a post on social media <laughs> and be like, that Snyder. No, for real, we were hunting last season and. Um, what were you guys hunting? Uh, elk hunting. We were elk hunting. <laughs> and uh, and uh, before we, we were up on the mountain, we had spotty connection. Aaron looks up, you know, you're downloading the regs on PDF. And it yeah. says uh, squirrel. And then it says uh, the season's open. Um, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, and so we shoot a squirrel on with his recurve, mm-hmm. you know, nice headshot. Nice. Uh, and, and he talks about how you skin a squirrel. He's eaten lots of squirrels, like just in the back country. Mm-hmm. Um, so other poaching incidents. How he, how he, <laughs> how, he, no, no. And then how you, how you eat it, skin it, whatever. So we go through the whole thing on video 
and we eat the squirrel and anyway we make the video and uh we put it out there uh and then and then a little you know people are watching it and we get some emails like uh what squirrel did you shoot what state what time of day what 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 date did you actually kill the squirrel and i'm like <laughs> red flags are going uh -oh. off like uh oh <laughs> and uh i'm like aaron you did check the regs he's like yeah i checked the regs i'm like well and so we're at his house and i'm like open them up let's and so he pulls them up and he's looking at them and it says squirrels he's like see and the date and then it says falconry so you can hunt them with a falcon sick <laughs> but you can't with a bow for like three more days Mm -hmm. Or so, like a week. Got to give them a little bit of time to start <laughs> running from those hawks before you can bust right. out the bows. Right. So technically, he shot a uh, illegally shot a uh, squirrel out of season. So um, I was like, Aaron, you're you're gonna have to. We're gonna have to call yeah. Fish and Wildlife and kind of explain that what happened. You know. So we do that, and you can almost lose your license in Colorado. Uh, but if you shoot a squirrel, it's, it's so you get so many points on your license, mm -hmm. and once you lose all those points, you you mm -hmm. or get you get points applied, you you lose your license, and it was a very, it, it was a lot. It's close. Now we ended up with, uh, you know, we we spoke to Fish and Wildlife for quite a while. We got a warning. Aaron got a warning, and and there's a whole thing. It was very well. It was a very professional and handled really well, and you know, but it. It was one of those things where that term poaching gets thrown around. And, you know, for me, it's like I know people in town that are trapping squirrels and poisoning them because they're getting into their house or their, you know, the roof of their whatever. And and that's not like almost not considered a problem no. or illegal. Because yeah. they're on our territory. <laughs> but when you're up in the mountains and you shoot one with a, a, with a, with a recurve and you eat it in camp, that's poaching technically i mean it is i'm not saying yeah. i'm not justifying it at all i'm no. just saying it's sort of it's a little funny yeah and uh anyway um when aaron and i were working a lot with first light and then we were working with you guys we had a few people write in and say how can you work with sitka because they support known poachers and i was like what are you what are you talking about and they're like those montana wild boys they're poachers and so uh, I, I had to call Aaron. I'm like, what are people talking about? And <laughs> and he's like, oh, oh. And he kind of ran it by me. So now I got you guys here on the podcast. I'm going to get your – uh, Yeah, <laughs> man. Now, now you're in the spotlight. Yeah. What's this uh, What's this poaching accusation? Yeah, it's a serious deal. Yeah. <laughs> Fly fishing, you know. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing dead. But, yeah, the term poaching, it's yeah. thrown at anything that – Someone, if you broke any kind of law, like you're, you a know, you're a poacher all of a sudden. But well, I think that word technically, you know, it's, maybe it technically means that. I don't know. Um, you know the definition's like actually, like I think taking an animal's life illegally. Illegally, yes, yeah, yeah, right. Um, you could on a snowboard hill if you poached my line, that means yeah, you went ahead of me <laughs> in like <laughs> snowboarder slang, <laughs> like you stole my line, dude. But other than that, yeah. I believe poaching is like taking, taking animals' life illegally. Animal illegally. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, our story is really long. Um, Dude, let's hear it. No bull trout were killed. Two drop hour, two hours. Drop later, it like a top. And we're done. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, it was from 2013, so it's been four years now. Um, mm -hmm. But that was the first year we started as a business. And yeah. Just when we started fly fishing, we went to the fly fishing film tour, got Jack to go fishing, and just. You know, you're like, we're going to do a films film for and being confident. You know, we're like, dude, we're going to make a film for the fly fishing film tour. There's no trout mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's all exotic locations. Like we're college kids. Like there's gotta be, there's cool stuff that could be on the screen here. And you know, when you're sitting in Missoula or in Bozeman, everybody there really, they're mostly trout fishermen. Right. Except for the guys that oh, have it dialed and go, absolutely. you know, tarpon or do whatever. But and those films in the, that tour, they're awesome. Yeah, I mean, right now, I yeah. mean, they're just on another level. I like them generally. I like them a lot more than I like many of the hunting films. Yeah, um, they 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 step up their level of cinematography mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It's yeah. very, it's easy. It's eye candy. It is. You can easier. go back out and fish the next day if you miss some shots. Right. <laughs> Once you kill your elk or deer, you're kind of done. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> so we're like, well, we want to make a cool film in our backyard and like show people that can have a sick adventure without flying to an exotic location. Yep. And just being hunters, bull trout fishing is the closest thing to hunting. You're getting out in the back country typically, you know, because bull trout are living in cold, clear water. They're also most of the time sight fishing them, like hunting a fish yeah. down and trying to catch that particular fish. And so it really resonated with us. I know there's a lot of people in the, uh, you know, that, that don't have the opportunity to fish for that fish. Yeah. Because it's just protected in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing that's kind of funny with the regs is you can pretty much go fish a streamer in bull trout water and you're good. You can go, I mean, the biggest cutties we catch are on streamers. Yeah. So unless a warden's over your shoulder and you're like, yeah, hey, there's a bull trout down there. Well, I'm going to catch him. You it's know, just like, kind of one of those things up to the warden's discretion on what's like, what is targeting bull trout? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's say, not legal to target bull trout. No. But you if can you catch, them, you can can catch them on accident streamers, because you're fishing you can, yeah. other species that take it. Right. But this That's is aside from, this is kind of aside from this because yeah. we were in there intentionally, like we were intentionally fishing. Yeah. But you guys were trout. fishing so, in a spot that was l- legal yeah. in to target yeah. bull trout. Because so, cause a lot of times people will come along and they'll say, you know, um, it's not right to, to uh, hunt a certain species because they're threatened or endangered. Yeah. But, um, for example, I'll use Colorado. Pine squirrels mm-hmm. are threatened in a lot of places. And so people are like, you can't shoot a pine squirrel. Mm-hmm. In Colorado, there's more pine squirrels than you could imagine. There's, yeah. Just in that locale, they're just, they're just booming. So... Um, Hunting in an area where there's, it's like saying, you know, you can't hunt elk in uh, Missouri yeah. um, because they're threatened in Missouri. Well, the yeah, whole they, population could eventually spiral Yeah, there's like, <laughs> let's say there's five in Missouri. Well, yeah, yeah, I get it. But they're not in danger of disappearing from the planet when you've got like 200,000 in Colorado. Well, right? and people don't or understand that 000. when something's threatened or even endangered, more so like, you know, threatened, mm-hmm. they don't understand that how tough it is to get them off of. Yeah, that, that designation to where it's like, you know, like if it, even if an animal is recovered. Oh, yeah. Just we, like we, wolves, as hunters, we like know that because of grizzlies and, and wolves and yeah, how yeah. hard it is to get delisted. But but when you sit there and you talk about this bull trout thing, some people are like, well, they're so rare. You know, it's just even if it's okay to sh- to, to target them in this in this watershed, I just think it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, whoa, 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 that watershed is so chock full of a certain species. Yeah. Um, it's actually perfectly sustainable to harvest out of that that area yeah and so like the area we're in fish run out of hungry horse reservoir bull mm-hmm. trout and to spawn yeah Up and you can Park. go is it i don't remember exactly but it's one or two bull trout that you can legally harvest from the reservoir yeah you can kill two bull trout out of the reservoir that these bull trout run out into the south fork so it's not even catch and release you can keep like, keep these yeah, fish one Per day, you yeah. can't actually like two in a day, but two throughout the year. Okay, total. And there's yeah, there's resident fish in the river, you know, but there's mm-hmm. a lot, some really big ones, obviously, that live in the reservoir that mm-hmm. run out. And the only thing I want to remind people of on that stuff is because it drives me nuts is this is all managed by biologists, yep, mm-hmm. who know a lot more than we do mm-hmm. about how to manage their fisheries and their yeah. their mm-hmm. their uh, their wildlife. Yeah. Our wildlife. And, yeah. So, 2013, we want to go make this film. Yeah. We're like, the South Fork of the Flat is the only legal place you can fish for bull trout. Yeah. And we had driven around. You can drive around on the low end, and we'd done a bunch of cutty fishing, and you obviously see bull trout. And so, it was kind of like, this is like the dream trip, is to actually get way back in there. Yeah. You know, get packed in and, and do this whole thing, and we're going to go film it. And so, I made a couple calls to the film office. You know, we're just had got our business license there's not a lot of right. information on film permits like hey here's what we're doing you know and had a couple of like hour plus conversation hour long plus conversations and here's what we're doing you know what's the process how do i get a permit do i need a permit you know right. trying to understand the entire process and how it's viewed and what the hoops are you have to jump through and the consensus was it, you guys you're not monetizing it yeah you guys are good like there's nothing against sharing your experience Right. Yeah. And there's there's so many inconsistencies there, even from wilderness to wilderness and mm-hmm. whoever's running the show at that place and who you talk to because I deal with that all the time and 
and uh wilderness is a pain yeah um it, you know there's there's in the whole permit thing it's like well a guy can run a camera and take as many photos as he wants and even sell those mm -hmm. and there's yep. generally no issues with that but yep. if a guy takes a video he's and no. we're talking like a gopro yeah you're criminal if you, you want. It's to like all, use yeah. It. It's like it's all one button or the other, and it's <laughs> illegal, you know. And, and the thing is, is I've talked to everyone from like Giannis at Meat Eater to you know, born and raised outdoors to uh, you know, Hush, all about how they deal with permits. Randy Newberg, mm -hmm. um, how are you dealing with permits? You know, yeah, and and filming and everything and. And uh, everybody almost has a different opinion on it. And there are some who get them and some who don't. And they monetize the hell out of their stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just, the whole thing with filming on uh, the, the original, it's like, to me, it's it's a little bit like when Idaho says you can't put anything electronic on your bow. And then you mount a GoPro to it. And yeah. you get a ticket, but it didn't aid in the harvest of no. of a, your ga of getting game, which was the original intent of the law. The original intent of getting a permit is, you know, when Hollywood production films were out there filming like big, big Hollywood movies, they'd go out, wreck the forest, and yeah. leave it, and they'd make all this money on this public resource that now is damaged. That's damaged and not pay for yeah. that money to the to us who own it as yeah. as citizens, and also leave it trashed yeah. and so but that's a whole lot different than when i walk out and leave no trace that i was there mm -hmm. and i run a gopro well, and a sony a7s2 well it's not. like your impact is no different than because you would have been out there probably anyways other than now you have a camera in your hand. It's, it's so completely and it's no different than it would be with a that it is with a photographer yeah. who sells their product yeah. so for me i i have a really the intent of the law and what it is right now in the books, I don't think I align. Mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be better written. It has to um, be changed. And it there's needs people to be changed. wanting to change it. But basically, you guys go in, you you get the, have the discussions. You're like, do we need one? Do we not need yep. one? What's the story yeah. here? And they're like, hey, you're not going to monetize it. Just go out and do it, which yep. I've heard a lot. Yeah. And, and I've and, done. And so... We got our catch cards, which is what you need to go and fish for bull trout. Okay. They send you a catch card so you can document your catches and line up the outfitter to pack us in. We go in there and um, obviously you're going to the South Fork. You're talking to other people. Where should we go? You know, we're going to go try to catch bull trout and they're telling us all these spots. And so we went in, I think it was 12 days. There's like a day of travel on each end. So I think we got like nine or 10 days of actually like fishing, which is awesome it'll mm -hmm. never happen again like that yeah um and came out and made this film and you know get a cut done send it out to the different brands we work with the film tour try to get a little feedback before you know you get that final version cut and license your music yeah. right they're like oh yeah it looks great license it, the music get the final cut done get the trailer done you know send it off to the fly fishing film tour which they had accepted the film to run in the tour. And I think we had the trailer up for like a month almost a month. Yeah. And it was at that, that point, this is like December. Mm -hmm. We're kind of starting to think about hunting films for next year. Yeah. Cause they have to be so far out in advance and we're mm -hmm. starting to think about permits more. And so we're learning more. And we learned that in the wilderness, they don't issue permits. It's like no to film. Right. And just in the process of learning, well, what's deemed commercial, it didn't mean that you monetized that video by selling it to someone. But if you had a logo in it, if you promoted you your mean, brand, if you if got a fly any, rod to use, if, if there's you, whatever, any right. way that the Forest Service could say you had commercial gain from this film, you're in the they're going to come after you. So when we learned, you know, that they're, the Forest Service is going to see the film, if they're going to deem it commercial. We now know this. Yeah, we that day, Travis and I were like, "Do we have to pull the film? Like, we, this yeah. is our because best film yet. We all, really want people to see this, but we have to just scratch the whole project and move on to the next thing." And for us, that when you're talking about permits, it's like uh, we when we have the opportunity to hunt wilderness, uh, we we 
you know, Aaron and I have seriously considered whether we do it or don't do it mm-hmm. because there is no real permit option at all. There is. So that means you, whereas with BLM or Unless some other designations, <laughs> right. And so it's really tough to get to go there at all. Mm-hmm. And so we even, we've even wondered, you know, if you're Instagram or live Facebooking some things that you're doing up there, are you now making film and monetizing it? If they don't like you enough. Yeah. And that's the whole <laughs> issue is it boils down to, um, by doing it, you give them an opportunity to do something if they want to. Mm-hmm. It's like a cop can write you a ticket for just about anything. He can find an, if he doesn't like you, he can yeah. find a reason. He can find he can something. Make your life tough. <laughs> and I don't like giving that um, power to someone else. So doing a, a film on wilderness, and this was for me all new as well. Like I, I learned it a little late. So we've got some film. We've got footage we have never shared either mm-hmm. because it, we didn't have permits for it. Yeah. But other other areas, I've like Hush does a ton of it too. Um, people sometimes get annoyed with us because we're hunting on some private land. I'm like, yeah, but with private, I can film any way I want yeah. mm-hmm. and there's no issues. I go and hunt this public piece and I have to deal with all sorts of problems with it. Yeah. Oh, it's a pain. Just the whole process. I mean, you got to do it. At, you got to fill out an application, do it at, at least 30 days yeah. before you want that permit. Not to mention like picking out sections on a map. Like you, mm-hmm. most of the time they want to know the exact area and, um, yeah, it's just, it's oh, not an easy process by any means, not to mention it's expensive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so then, so you guys decide, you know what, this is just not going to work. Yeah. This is, we, this is not a good idea. We're going to, we, we, this is a hard lesson learned. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're like, this really sucks. Cause we just, this is our first year of business. Just go make this film. Yeah, and now we're having to tell the sponsors and the tour, sorry, we can't, we got to just pull this film. Yeah, yeah. We're just, it's going to live on our hard drives forever. Cause it's yeah. just not. It, we didn't do it right. Yeah. Um, Which has happened to and many, like, many an outdoor. Sh- are you sure? <laughs> well, are yeah. you, we can not this just this one location. Can we <laughs> just, next time we'll make sure we don't do this. We can use this one, right? And we were like, no. no. Like, we want to do this Like, right. this is going to reflect on your brand. Yeah. And that's, like, our business. We care about our partnerships. Right. You know, and we right. don't want to reflect poorly on your brand. Like, this is the best move for everybody here, not just... Us. Yeah. So we pulled the film. Yeah, you know, uh, one of some of my early favorite films in Oregon were um, uh, Two Weeks in Purgatory and Return to Purgatory, mm-hmm. which are two Oregon boys that film their uh, hunts in Hell's Canyon area on yeah. Oregon's side. And But basically, at the end of the day, their movies were out for years. They sold a whole bunch of DVDs, and then they came along and said, hey, uh, where's your permit for that? Well, there's a ton of guys who never had permits for most of their outdoor films. Oh, yeah. But they never got bothered because they never acted like, I mean, I'm speculating. They never pissed off, they you just, know. Yeah, they didn't get the right people the people in off. charge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they were like, yeah, no, big deal. Yeah. But in this case, they're like, they didn't like what they did and they um, shut them down. Mm-hmm. It got on the right person's desk. They needed a raise, and so they had to be taken down. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. I think, I honestly, <laughs> I think they really did cross the line in how they uh, treated the state officials. Yeah, I, yeah. I haven't and, heard a lot uh, about that. I mean, I, I've briefed But I don't know. I don't know. I'm, uh, this is the rumor. Yeah. But the bottom line is um, they got uh, they got completely shut down, mm-hmm. and, and, and it pretty much just kind of – shut down most of everything they'd earned and worked for yeah. because of that technicality on that yeah. permit process. And, uh, so it is, it is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, now, we, again, we very seriously now that we yeah. know the process. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and there are certain places like where, like I said, where I think nobody cares whether you have a permit or not. And others like wilderness where, I heard Renella talk about it a few times now on the Mediator podcast, and they're just, they don't even bother hunting in no. those areas because yeah. you can't it's make a pain. show. Yeah. So you it's just, just off them. limits. Yeah. Which is a bummer. So you guys and bail out. And that's a bummer because the filmmakers don't want to be advocates for new wilderness because they're like, I can't go there and yeah. create cool content and inspire well, again, people. I think which the, the, I, the, the concept purpose, of wilderness is the purpose for that land or for that law. And all of that is just distorted now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not. 
And, you know, we just, I just heard Renilla do that podcast on wilderness and, and that's no impact. Uh, the whole point of having wilderness is to have, you know, have it be set aside in a way where there's very, very, very little human involvement and so mm-hmm. forth. But you can hunt wilderness. And like well, you said, like, there's no difference between you being out there other than you have a little camera. But in your the hand. weird thing is, is an outfitter that can actually guide in the wilderness area. They can film all year long Every and day. promote those videos on their website all day long about the wilderness. Yeah, if I'm an outfitter in the Bob Marsh, I can make promotional videos. I can have, I can hire someone to come film my outfit every day of the year under my special use permit. Tell me how you really feel about that. <laughs> well, it just doesn't make it's, sense. Yeah, it's just the, kind of like the mentality of like, all right, something needs to happen here. Yeah. So like, I'm uh, giving my outfitter license, <laughs> and then I can go film. Okay. In the so so carry on. So, so. Yeah. So we pull the film. And, you know, at this point, we have zero idea that there's been any bull trout violations of any kind. Mm-hmm. And so it's like sometime the next spring, you know, like knock, knock, March, knock. March, yeah. Here's a warden's with search permit or search <laughs> warrant <laughs> saying, you guys illegally fish for bull trout. I can, like, they're going to, like, take down some, like, serious <laughs> poaching ring or something. <laughs> yeah. And so we're like, dude, you got this mixed up, like, we didn't do anything yeah, wrong. Like, like we, we went in, we had season. catch cards. We were in the season. Like you yeah. guys got bad information. You're like, this is crazy. Like, you know, and it was like a couple of days later when I'm talking to Ryan on the phone, one of the investigators. And I'm like, what's the deal? Like, what's going on here? You know, like, what did we do? What's up? Yeah. He's like, well, you guys fish for bull trout in the tributaries. I'm like, yeah, we did. Mm-hmm. He's like, you can't fish for bull trout in the tributaries. I was like, we had no idea. Yeah. It was just Honest a honest mistake. Like, you know, yeah. But like, yeah. And was, so at that point, and in all the research, you know, going into this trip, no one ever, and that's, this isn't their fault. I mean, yeah, but no. this is just, we thought we knew the regs. We talked to people and we looked at the regs and the catch card that year, it, it marks different sections of the river. So when you catch a, bull trout you know you write the estimated length what mm-hmm. section of river and you know youngs and danaher's on the map and there's other tribs coming in on the map mm-hmm. and just the assumption was we can go fish the tribs right and you know it's like you can fish upstream from the mouth of the hungry horse reservoir to mm-hmm. uh you know the where youngs and danaher danaher like come together and i don't know it just the regs weren't clear Mm-hmm. And now the regs are very clearly <laughs> they, different. They changed them. And so, so if the regs were clear enough the first time, why did they change them yeah, after, after this? You know, which again, we, we took and, ha- you know, we've taken responsibility for, for all of it. Yeah. It's all yeah. accounted for. You know, we the got way the regs were crushed supposed to be written and read, we were in the wrong. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But people think that is this was an intentional. We were trying to get away with something. I mean, we made a film for the fly fishing film tour. I know it's pretty hard to not know you're in the White River. It's like a white cobblestone <laughs> bottom where Travis and Anthony are like, "We're up the White River today. Like we yeah. just spotted bull trout. Yeah. We're gonna rock paper scissors for who gets to fish yeah, for if it." If it was not legal, you wouldn't be sitting there telling people, you know, all this stuff. It's like when we filmed the squirrel thing. If we knew it was not in season, would we have made a YouTube video and exactly. put it on YouTube? Exactly. Yeah. And and it, again, it it's our responsibility to re- mm-hmm. read the regulations and know the regulations. Yeah. I talked to my but we were in uh, Prince of Wales Island hunting black bear this spring and my buddy Anthony, my one of my closest friends, he's uh, a fish and wildlife officer in Oregon. And we were in the room talking about this very issue. And he's uh, you know, he's like, "Brian, come on, man." It's your job to know the regs. Did you even read the regs here in Prince of Wales? Did you go through the thing? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I read through what I think I need to know and stuff. And he's like, I'm like, but Anthony, you have to have a minor degree in like in 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 legalese to, yeah. to like understand some of this stuff or to follow it all. And he's like, no, it's not that complicated. Well, Ranella did that thing where they did that turkey deal. Uh where they interviewed or polled people, they had them read all the regulation, and then they said, okay, do you feel confident after reading this that you could hunt a turkey legally? Mm-hmm. And I think it was like 8 out of 10 said no. Yeah. that That's not good. So yeah. I think it's a well-known issue that our regulations are intimidating. They're, 
they're confusing. They're not always the best written. And it's very easy to, to overlook or make a mistake like this yeah. in that situation. At the end of the day, though, it's still your fault. Yeah. You got to own it. It's yeah. the regs are there. Um, and, and yeah, it Our, sucks. Ours is a bad scenario because obviously there's a lot of people out doing that stuff. I mean, we have our reasons to believe that someone said the right stuff to the right people that just didn't like us. And, oh, yeah. you know, I think they said things that didn't end up proving themselves when they showed oh, up. Dude, when Aaron shot and that a two year, I mean, it was a two year investigation and that's so, I mean, the they amount took- of taxpayer money to, to fine us for some film permits and fine us for some fishing where they can't even show a dead fish. Cause they, well, when they came in, they didn't realize, I mean, we're two college students. Yeah. We have footage on hard drives from when we were in high school skiing backed up twice on Zach's side and mine took all of our computers, all of our hard drives and it's FWP. You think they got computers that can run HD video Mm-mm. files? Yeah. Heck no. They had to store it at the FBI. Over in Billings, and which travel, is like seven mi- hours from travel like- <laughs> seven hours to go review this footage from like five years, and it's just it's just mind boggling to think that you know. Okay, we, you, so. this stuff just because we Aaron and I, you know, we everyone I think that maybe has a has some level of high pro- profile. You know, um, Aaron and I have been investigated a couple of times already. Um, I feel like there's just in some sense, there's there's just you you get a name, and then there are going to be people uh, that outside the hunting in or out that 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 just hate you in yeah. general. Yeah. Uh, and then there's going to be fish and wildlife too that want to not. It's just like cops. Mm-hmm. Not everyone's created equal. Yeah. You have some amazing fish and wildlife officers, oh, yeah. and then you have some that that probably need to find a new career. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, aren't the most ethical and so, or, or let their own emotions get so involved. But uh, it's, yeah, it's a tough thing because yeah. their job and what they do is a good thing. But you know what? But though, sometimes <laughs> that kind of money spent on a situation like that is, yeah. is it's, it's frustrating. And, and it, at the, at that point too, it, it feels like a witch hunt when they're confiscating hard drives from five years back and all this kind of oh, stuff yeah. and going that far. We took our phones. We went, <laughs> Travis and I shared like a prepaid Walmart phone for like <laughs> however many months, Six you months. know? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so at the end of the day, what, what were the, what did you get fined with? Uh, what was the citation? I, I mean, so you, you so the, just the citations and the legal process was just what? a two hour discussion at least. <laughs> well, anyways, so one of the, so we got a bunch of violations from the beginning mm-hmm. um, for the film permits and then for the fishing violations. And one of the things that in the beginning we didn't actually f- get charged with it in the end, but the catch card, you know, where you write your bull trout down, you have to write the length and either in section A, B or C on this map, you know, it's broken into thirds with the South Fork running through it and tributaries coming off. You have to mark where you caught it. And so we had marked all of our bull trout, and at the top it says your last name and then a number, so you know which one's yours. We're brothers. There's two battle so cards. <laughs> we have the same last name, and we filled out each other's cards. And all the bull trout were accounted for on there. The information was correct it's for the biologist so he knows where bull trout are at certain parts of the year, mm-hmm. they wrote us a ticket for every single bull trout on that card because it wasn't the correct catch card. And the cards are, wait, wait, the wait, cards wait. are hilarious. So Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't understand that. So okay. you have the catch card. When you catch a bull trout, you have to say, okay, it's this long. Yep. I caught it on this date. I get that. Inches, and yep. it's either in section A, which is the highest yep. on the river, right. B in the middle, or yeah, C. Yeah, you're just saying, I caught this fish on this day in this place, blah. Yep, and you have to fill it out yep. right away while you're on the trip yep. to document it so that the wildlife biologist, when you send it in when you're done, can be like, hey, he gets a better idea of where are these yeah, big so they fish can track at, stuff. at yeah. before they go and spawn or whatever. Yeah. So it's it's just information for the wildlife biologist, but it is le- like it's legal. legal. Like you legally yeah. have to do that. So we fill them out. All the bull trout are accounted for, even the ones in the tributaries, all on there. Yep. Yep. Um, it says at the very top, it doesn't say your full name, it says Bouton and then like a number. 
and the that's permit number. The you know, permit, how many you let, they so that you know that it's your card. Anyways, we didn't think it was like we thought. I thought I had my card and he had his. Mm-hmm. And well, they're in the trip. You're in the back country. All three cards, Travis and mine and Anthony's, are all together. Yeah. So it's like we don't. Have, where's my card? You know, like they're in one spot. Mm-hmm. And FWP uh, after the season's closed, I think in August or September, they sent you know everyone that applied for a permit. They send you out paperwork saying, "Hey, you know, fill out the paper here." Yeah. You know, send your catch card back in so they can get their information. Right. And so you know you have to sign your catch card and sign the paperwork. And at that point in time, we both have signed ours. And when you get your paperwork back, <laughs> now I see that <laughs> the paperwork that has my full name on it doesn't match the number that's on my catch card. So I'm like, ah, oh, I fill out your catch card, dude. So I scratch out my signature and Travis then signs that card. And I'm like, whoa, well, now you just signed a card that's my fish. So then I scratch his signature out and I sign it again. So now it has three signatures, but it's actually my fish that I signed for. But With the it's wrong on number Travis's on the card. card. Yeah. And so they wrote us tickets for all those fish. So, yeah. And that's so that's like, like 10 or 12 tickets right there. Each. They wrote Travis tickets for fishing for bull trout, where you can see cutties in the water. And he's on, like, what, a four-weight glass rod with a dry fly? With a dry fly. Catching cutties. On film. Yeah. On film. But you can't. There's, you can't do anything until you go to court and fight it. It's right. not like, hey, Brian, you oh, wrote no. a bad ticket. No, I know. <laughs> I know how that all rolls. You, know. you better have some money. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when it comes down to well, some and, of that. Until someone knows, like, the legal process of paying an attorney and like how much it costs to go to court which i've done three times it's like which and i'll tell you this and i tell this to everybody and uh we've we've aaron and i have done three shows discussing um wildlife violations and in the end it it uh we need to we need to get someone on and have some more discussions but we always end up not publishing the show Mm -hmm. Because it turns into, uh, uh, you know, a lot of disagreements on things. And it's a yeah. shame because, like you said earlier, I really appreciate and value the service that's being done. But stuff like this kind of pisses me off. Yeah. And when, and I just have a general rule in, in general. If I'm involved in any kind of uh, legal dispute with a police officer or a fish and wildlife or it doesn't matter. If I get some sort of investigation coming on, I straight up go straight straight lawyer mm-hmm. right away yeah right off the bat i just say i'm not going to talk to you we're going to talk through an attorney yeah. because all because i just don't have the trust no and, no, and uh, no one of the biggest mistakes not mistakes but from the beginning we went and sat down with those guys like two or three days after they came and showed up on our door and told them everything recorded conversation sat down the guy from the forest service was there Went through all the films, told See, them where we filmed them. Here's the deal, Zach. Like, we were like, dude, this is an honest mistake. Like, let's figure out how to if, get this if right. You, if you do that approach and you're and you're working with someone or a group of people that genuinely kind of trust what you're doing and mm-hmm. and are like, look, these guys are just trying to do the right thing and blah 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 blah, and they have your best interest at heart and and also the wildlife's interest at heart. It's it's a it's it's both yeah. ways, right? Mm-hmm. And you're working together, then that sort of frank discussion is good, yeah. but. If someone's just trying to stick you to the wall and they already think you're guilty before you're even talking, yeah. all you did was just give them a whole bunch of information to to do what they want to do. Uh, we know but that. But that and was so our frustration like, is because from day one, we just want to get this corrected and make it right. We are never going to put anything out in the papers or the press or anything like that. Yeah. And the Forest Service is like, hey, we'll probably just write you one or two tickets just to, you know, make sure that we have something on the books, but we're not going to ticket you for everything. Yeah. And the heard- FWP was like, we're not going to make this a big deal. You know I mean? It's public so, record. So if someone wants to find it, they can look it up, but we're not going to make press releases or anything. We're like, let's figure this out. Let's sit down and talk. Let's get it dialed yeah. in. We want to make this right. <clears throat> yeah. No, I've not seen that end well very often because uh-huh. um, it, if uh, I was investigated not too long ago, and this is something I didn't know, and it, it really d- disappointed me. But uh, someone had called fish, fish officer and fish cop, and he was like, "Hey, you know, blah blah blah. I have these questions for you." Da da da. da and started asking him, and and then he said, uh, and "Then he's like, hey, I know, I know the truth about this situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so and so told me the truth, and this is what you did. Mm-hmm. Tell me the truth. This is what happened, isn't it?" No. <laughs> no. 
no, I have, I have evidence. I have evidence on this day and this day that you did this and this. And I'm like, mm, that couldn't be. And tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. And I was like, whoa, but I like on a scene of law and order, you know, this yeah. is like, and then, uh, come to find out that, uh, it's perfectly legal for them to lie to you. Yeah. The, well, I, they, in a lot of cases, I mean, they're trained to make you like, if you've ever done anything guilty to spill the beans and, and like, I applaud, they're trying to do a job, but yeah. at that point, the trust factor went down the tubes yeah. when I realized that, that the officer was lying to me on all of these things, trying to get me to crack on something I didn't do. Yeah. At that point, I'm like, you know, I don't want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. I want you to talk to an attorney of mine yeah. because I don't feel like you're really looking for the truth here. You're looking for something to write a just ticket for. Write a ticket for. Yeah. So I just have a, I have a really hard time uh, that, and I think a lot of hunters do, mm-hmm. trusting or not trusting. Uh, and and again, it's it's not that there's a lot of dudes out there that are doing stuff illegally and. And I, I'm like, the first thing hunters do is we want to see those poachers busted, yeah. Yeah. you know, but then there's some things where it's an accident and I see someone get like in, in the court of public opinion, just get eaten alive. Yeah. And I hate, I hate to see that because it's like, dude, the guy made a mistake. Mm-hmm. You know, he went through this gate to get to this piece of property. He didn't know it was trespassing. And, and you're like, Mistakes really? happen all the time. I mean, like we had a film and no one, I mean, we sent it to people that have done a lot of fishing at big companies. Yeah. That you know, and no one was like, hey, here's a red flag. Like it would have went and played in the film tour. And just like Yeti had a film, you know, with the brothers and their dad hunting mule deer. I don't know if you saw it. And supposedly they're in Montana when they shot the film and they used radios. Yeah. You know, which is illegal in Montana. And Yeti, no one at Yeti ever caught it. Mm-hmm. And it got, you know, posted. I mean, they broke the law. I'm sure they're, you know, handling it. Yeah. But, you know, something slipped through the cracks, you know. I mean, yeah. and it's not well, a lot like, of times it's not, not like intentional. And it's not out. an excuse to say it was your, their job to know the rule no. and no, figure but it out. But little things happen here and there where they're not poachers. I mean, they are, hold them accountable to the law. Yeah. But all you don't have to try to ruin people over an infraction here. They're like, look at the larger body works. If people are continually screwing up, like right. there's, there's an issue, issue there. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, long story short, uh, our buddy, Anthony, he was a fishing guide. So obviously he has no choice, but to fight it. And we yeah. wanted to, but I mean, he's kind of first up to bat and, yeah. uh, the County prosecutor cut him an awesome deal where he only took one ticket and a small fine. FWP didn't like it. And so they're like, we're pretty much going to throw the book at you guys, the bros Mm -hmm. (laughs) at this point. Um, or you're going to take this plea deal and keep your license. And so, I mean, it's kind of a, just a no brainer. Cause if you have a handful of tickets and the judge still wants to ding you on one and you lose your license, I mean, was it worth it? You won five out of six or you have won seven right. out of eight or whatever it is, you know? And well, so, and the thing is once you go to court, you just don't know where you're going to be at. You know, there's a guarantee if you take, uh, you know, some kind of plea deal, you know what the outcome is. Yeah. Like you make that choice. There's a lot of, uh, unknowns when you go the other route. Yeah. Um, and it's just life. Aaron's been going through court with divorce right now and stuff. And it's like, turns your life upside down. They say like of all the things, like death, someone's, you know, losing someone and court are like two of the most yeah. and, and divorce, but, but uh, anything to do with being sued oh, are some of the most life, uh, intense, and, and, you know, uh, like stressors. Stressful moments. Oh yeah. yeah. People well, can never we have. We were under investigation for two years and then, I mean, just that. And then the aftermath of. And we, you know, we took the plea bargain and it's such a long it. process where like our attorney's dealing with the County prosecutor and it's like offers on the table for 24 hours. Yeah. And your attorney calls you four hours later and you're out on the river and it's like, why? Well, uh, okay. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, I mean, it's such they're not high, taking our license. It's you know? such like, high I'm, pressure. I'm fine. Like, yes, technically we fished in the tributaries. I have no problem yeah. taking those tickets, paying the fine, moving on. Right. You know? 
where core it's going to be how much money how much more time how much more energy and stress and well and it also know, takes dollars i know people who uh are absolutely guilty of absolutely poachers yeah <laughs> And spent ten to twenty thousand dollars and got away with everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the other thing that it's just the way our court system is. I mean, you love America and everything, but at the end of the day, if you have money, you can fight things. And the budget, you know, the way I've understood it too is, fish and wildlife is like the lowest. The, the it, you know, no one got murdered. Yeah. Uh, no one. No one was killed. You know, up on a. When, when someone goes out and poaches a deer, mm-hmm. especially if it's to like to feed their family. Yeah. So when it comes down to someone's fighting that pretty hard, the state has a budget mm-hmm. and no one, no one in the main community really cares if a guy shot a deer, you know, when you're dealing with someone who murdered or someone who embezzled millions of dollars from yeah. something. I mean, there's only there's so much money to go around, and we're kind of like when it comes to wildlife, it's at the end of the the end of the deal. Yeah, it's not a top tier of government. And agency. so a lot of times when people go into fighting it, it gets it gets dropped. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you got to be willing to spend tens of thousands, you know, five, ten, well, oh, yeah. ten tens. to twenty thousand, yeah. really, ten thousand, even thirty. But and then it's just like everybody loses. Yeah. In yeah. that case. Yeah. Everybody loses, but I'm kind of at that point in my life where, you know, I've been to court three times. I've, 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 uh, been sued twice and I've sued someone else and I'm, I'm just like, you want to go? Let's go. Bring it on. I'll get an attorney yeah. and we'll go, we'll do the dance. And I just feel like I've never regretted hiring an attorney yeah. and, uh, and go, going, going the rounds, especially if I feel like. I'm innocent or it's, this isn't fair or I don't believe in the process. I'm like, dude, I will mortgage my home and my future just out of my own dignity to, to fight this. And, and one time I spent, I, it took me years to pay off that debt. And looking back, I won, but I was like, maybe that wasn't the smartest move, but it's just how I'm wired. Yeah. And it, I should, I would have been way better off in hindsight to just let it go. Yeah. But I, I didn't. And, uh, but I, I, uh, in these situations, um, uh, they're so, you know, when you're dealing with someone who has trained their whole life to do investigations, to do interviews, to, to, to talk about these things, they're, they're, they're much more skilled. And I, I've seen this too many times where, uh, they're like, look, if you just admit you did X, Y, Z, if you just admit that we're not going to go hard on you you know it's just going to be a warning and you're going to be back in business put it on paper and then you're like (laughs) okay yeah i'll say i did it and then they're like okay now you get every single fine known to man and your license taken away (laughs) for three years and so forth and it's like never do that no never do that and so uh and that's that's to do regardless of whether it's fish and game or whether it's uh and that's uh, frustrating because it's like people make mistakes and they should feel comfortable wanting to work with the people to make it right and then people yeah like take advantage of it and it it just sets a bad tone how would you say this has changed you oh i mean it was just a growing experience just Mm -hmm. as a human being in general i mean i I don't think many people as like starting a business go through right off the bat a two year investigation and have to deal with what we did. Yeah. Um, so like after the, once we've like everything that's gone through, it's kind of like we can make it through anything. And I mean, the biggest thing was actually, you know, we got the charges, we took the plea. Um, you know, originally we were charged with like 40 something combined, 40 something combining like charges between with three, dudes. three, between three dudes and film permits. I think that's all lumped together. <laughs> and when they came out with the that's state, just anything that, that, that people can find. I mean, at that point, it's not about, it's just well, like, let's just hit them with everything and see which one's well, <laughs> And when they came out with the statement, which this was the worst part is when FDB came out the statement on their website, they said, charged with 49 or 47 citations were they guilty to those no but that's the headline 49 yeah. citations written for bold you can write as many as you want blah, blah, and the blah. paper misprint stuff and they don't have well, any accountability and you know you can't go and 
sue them unless you have hard evidence of someone had it out to yeah. defame you. You know what I'm saying? Well, and that was the big thing too. Is as soon as that came out, you know, and they said we had an impact on the fishery, and but no bull trout were killed whatsoever. Not to mention, if we even did anything that was like that horrible, they would have taken our licenses right away. Yeah, yeah. Like it was just you guys did catch and release on all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, catch and release. And on it's all on film. film. Yeah, yeah. And the thing when it when it came out, we're like, well, we want to show some of this footage to people. But at that time, we didn't have an attorney that knew the laws well enough with the Forest Service to know that we weren't going to get dinged a second time if we start showing footage from the wilderness. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, right. are they going to come after us you again? You don't know. Now? Yeah. It's well, a, and it's, even like, so and then, so on the on top of that, you know, we had the Forest Service, you know, film permit citations. He wrote us citations all the way back to the very first video we ever even shot fly fishing, which was with a GoPro on Rock Creek that we posted on YouTube. That at the time, it was embedded on our website, like our blog, and we were just starting to sell stickers. So it was considered commercial, mm-hmm. and we got ticketed for it. And then we had another film that wasn't even shot on Forest Service land, but he ticketed for it, us for Forest Service. And, you know, when you get the tickets, it's like 30 days or we'll see you in federal court. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'll take one ticket to federal court. And then when we, no. were, like, <laughs> when we were like, hey, hey, uh, we have a film, you know, that, you know, was for sure absolutely no Forest Service whatsoever. Um, we can't get in contact with him. Yeah, he's in the out, middle of out on fire season. <laughs> and so it's coming down to the wire. And we're like, dude, I'm not Just paying my fine. attorney for this like $150 ticket. But it still is like frustrating. I had to plead guilty to that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's Again, that's so a... many moving pieces that people don't get to see. They're like, I saw the press release that these guys are poachers, and you and, know. And I mean, it's like with anything. I mean, you're gonna have people that don't like you, or you know, at, at any little time you're down, they're gonna grab onto that and yeah. just try to just exploit you. And that's what they're doing. I mean, we had so many people in the fly fishing community calling us poachers, even though we didn't kill any bull trout. Yes, we fished tributaries for bull trout that we weren't supposed to. So apparently that makes us a poacher. But in people's mind, when they hear poachers, like, oh, they killed bull trout. Did you hear about Montana right, Wild right. killing bull trout? Which yeah, yeah. Happen. I mean, the whole situation, like we learned from, we could have handled stuff better and done things oh, differently. Sure. And we just... Going forward, you'd handle it oh, yeah. way different. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Like now, th- when that stuff pops up, I just don't get worried about it anymore. Mm. When someone sues me, I know the process. When when that stuff and it used to be highly stressful, and now now I'm just like, I, for, even when it comes to a contract, uh, Aaron and I talk about this with patents. You can have all the patents you want, but unless you got hundreds of thousands of dollars to back it up, yeah. it's just a piece of paper. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it's the case with everything. It it really boils down to you got to have the money to make some of this stuff work. It boils oh, down yeah. to I should have been an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you really want no, that? No, I know. It would be very fun. It's nice when you do have a good attorney. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's the other thing, too, is I've learned that a good attorney is is priceless. Yeah. I mean, it's just not only do uh, does, it, does it just change the game. And there's so much that goes on with it. It was funny. I, I, we were in a legal battle at one point, my first one I was ever in. And we, we were blessed with an attorney that was just, uh, remarkable. And, uh, we won not because of the Kate, the court case, but because of all the things that he did outside of the court case, like putting, uh, restraining orders on certain things and, and, filing federally instead of instead of at a state level yeah. so it didn't matter where the person moved to it mm-hmm. followed them and just all these creative things that he pulled out of his hat from all these different that had nothing to do with the actual case no. which caused that person to finally just you he know just was smart about the system and knew how yep. to work it to your advantage yep and that's the part where i think you you know when you talk about a good attorney you got to have that yeah. Uh, for it to be really effective and to really, you and know. you hope you never have to use them. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah. do, but but uh, uh, your average, a lot of those attorneys are like, well, the system's like this and it's like that, and they don't have that creativity in no. their in them, uh, to what I call creativity, and they 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 just don't, they can't, they don't get to through the system as well. Like yeah. it's a guy that's gonna like find a way. That's that's the He's guy like, you want. I got you. Yeah, we're going to find a way. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And, and uh, it's not easy, though, dude. 
not yeah. easy. Yeah, I, for sure. I, I feel I feel bad. You guys uh, went through that, but <laughs> dude, it was it was. I mean, it was a learning experience. I mean, it was a good example for was, other people too. Oh, for sure. I Especially mean, the film permit stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think that was like we had a lot of people contacting us after that, like. Hey man, I have. I all need this to talk stuff. to you about permits. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, am oh. I going to be in trouble? <laughs> right. Which I mean, it's cool to be able to like. I mean, just going through it, we know so much about it at right. this point compared to when we started. That uh, I mean, it's nice to be able to like try to at least give some help to people and have that knowledge. To, like, yo, you should go talk to this person. Like, if you really want to know that, like this person at the Forest Service. Yeah. Well, it's tough too because you, you don't know what you can talk about publicly and what you can't talk about publicly. And Aaron and I have kind of built the podcast, built built Gritty Bowman, built his. He's been, always been. We're we're very public, very open about our thoughts about mm-hmm. you know all this stuff. And I'm of the I'm like like I've shared quite a bit today about you know our some of our private dealings with yeah. uh, you know fish and wildlife kind of stuff. And I feel like. If um, if someone is acting in a way that I think isn't fair, mm-hmm. or is uh, is I think um, basically on a witch hunt or whatever, I'm going to be very open about my yeah. feelings on that. Mm-hmm. And and we live in a world today where there there can be repercussions about it. There can be, hey, this is my side of the story, and you have a voice and you have a platform, and you can tell it. Yeah, and so you're not just a victim in the way that, that you could be in years past. Mm-hmm. And I feel like with my platform, man, I, if, if I feel like <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting taken advantage of or unfairly treated, I'm going to be very open about it yeah. and let the court of public opinion play a role too. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Our, it's like tough too. I mean, at the time we had so like when, after it came out, we just put one statement, you know, and from our attorney and talking to other like mentors was just like, just put a statement out, you know, get to the point and just leave it. Yeah. Like, don't say anything else. Like people are going to, they're going to keep writing newspaper articles about every single thing you say from here on out. And so we had to leave it. And there's so much like to the story and like, they're just like, don't try to burn FWP. You know, you know, you probably have bad feelings towards the forest service and stuff on that. But unless you want them on your ass for the rest of your time doing this, let it go. You know, take Which, the like pride said, and swallow it. And it's just like the agencies, their job, the way it's laid out is good. It's for right. the benefit of the public and benefit of the wildlife. And, you know, there's always going to be isolated. We incidents. want them out there. Yeah. We want them doing what they do. We want them to do what they do. And so, I mean, there's frustration from like our personal scenario. And some of that, you know, I think is fair enough to tell people about. And there's stuff that I personally think that I won't say just because it's just not like, like I enjoy what those agencies do and we're going to continue to work with them, you yeah. know, to where, yeah. You know, you well, you're trying be- to give some of our side of the story and the most, in the best way without getting into a real, like it's tough, dude, spitting match you're of, a little what bit I, of a better man than me because <laughs> Aaron and I both, we've been talking about it for the last two, three months. There's, there's some things we want to air, man. Yeah. And, oh. and we're getting to a point where we're like, we're just going to say how we feel uh, and, and, and people can like it or not. And, but yeah. I agree. I don't want to sit here and, and villainize the very agencies that, 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 cause there's excellent people there. Yeah. My best, one of my best friends since childhood works and i i the work he does is is awesome Mm -hmm. and i if i were to get if someone if if he were the guy that were to to come and speak to me that he's the to me the epitome of what a fish and wildlife officer should be but they're not all created the same like i said before so i'm torn i want to support him but that doesn't mean i'm going to sit there and keep my mouth shut when they're misbehaving yeah, and that's yeah. the well, same with sure. e- everything from my kid to my, oh, yeah. to, to my, <laughs> you know, to an employer. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, so we try to just handle it like we handle it people. Yeah. If someone wants to ask us about, hey, what's your experience with this person that maybe I don't like? I'll say what the experience is. And yeah. they can, you know, make their own judgment call. But I'm not going to be like, that person's total garbage and yeah. I hate them and they yeah. suck. You know, like I, that's just, that's going to yeah. be my thought for me. Yeah. They can hear my experience and, you know. Different people are going to have different views of the Forest Service, of individuals, of brands. Well, 
conservation groups. I, so I, I got to applaud you because this film right here, the outlier is, is, is excellent. Um, you know, you guys are in this film, you, you, you do a lot, uh, of positive promotion for public lands. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you talk about the value of that and, and it, and and then you you bring in what I want a non hunter to see when it comes to to hunting, and this is the sort of film that really resonates with me as a hunter. Yeah. And you did that after getting your butts <laughs> uh, handed to you, and a lot of that drama and everything. And well, yeah. and it's like that was a learning experience, and most people, if they actually felt like they were like in the wrong, like say we intentionally did it, we would have quit. We would never be keep doing this. Yeah. But it was for us, like dude, I'm going to keep doing this. Like we know that it was just a mistake yeah. and we're going to let our work from here on out, like show who we are as individuals and that we're not bad people. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. And I got to applaud you, man. Cause there's a lot of people <laughs> who would just be like, screw this. I'm out. This is <laughs> yeah. just, this is just uh not part of what I want to, I don't want to, you know, get burned again or whatever. So yeah. it just was like the public perception was such a far, like, remove perspective of what we actually like st- stood for and what we thought that we just were like this hurts we're gonna keep doing it yeah dig out of the dig out of the hole yeah and it's it's not been easy but it's at the same time it's like like you're i mean i haven't had a single person come up to me in person that you yeah. know i know there's a lot of people out there that probably hate us for whatever they think yeah. we did no one will ever come talk to me face to face about it or be like Dude, what's what's your deal, man? You like out there just like raping the resource? <laughs> yeah. I'm Nobody. still waiting to applaud the first <laughs> hater to say something in public. Just be like, hey, I got respect for you, dude. Like, you're the first. You're the first one. <laughs> I mean, you, a lot of keyboard warriors talking some serious smack out there, but but yeah, yeah like the f- the film, I'm stoked on. I mean, oh, well, I think it's great. Yeah, you know, we tried to kind of weave in a little bit of a few pieces of why we value it and why, you know, conservation of public lands is important without getting like too Tell me heavy this. handed. And, you know, cause you know, a lot of times what we do is, is very, um, you know, partner driven, mm-hmm. you know, and you have different sponsors that, that are helping you out. Um, is there a positive experience with that coming out of this? I mean, was there, were there some companies that kind of stood by you? Yeah. yeah. There's a couple companies um, that have stood by us and supported us, you know, both through our business and just talking to us and as friends. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's other businesses that, on a personal level, they love us, you know, like, but they just distance themselves but from they you. Just are like, there's like a little buffer there now. Yeah, you know, and that's fine. I mean, it's business, and it's business doesn't always come down to how much you like somebody. Right, right. <laughs> you know, no, they got to I mean, feed their families and they got to make their living and like, they might really like you, but like their And they might agree with you, but you know. the p- p- perception is still there that mm-hmm. has to be uh, handled. I, I just curious because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering which, which companies out there like will stick their neck out yeah. on behalf of somebody or something that they believe in, even though it may be um, uh, hard for them. Like yeah. they take heat over it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough call for companies. Unfortunately, we do have a few that they understand. They're like, dude, you're good people. Like you told us from day one when you got ticketed and the, and the oh, warden yeah. showed up on your doorstep, which we told all of our sponsors when they took all of our hard doors. Like, Hey, we just want to let you know, like, this is what's happened. Like, we don't know what our charges are yet. They just said we were legally fishing for bull trout and tributaries. And we just want you guys to know from here on out and anyone that we even started relationships with, that was like one of the first conversations <laughs> yeah. we had. And even like with companies that dropped us over the incident, we told them on the first day we even talked about like working with them. Yeah. This is what's going on. Um, and I mean, that's just, I guess who we are as individuals just being honest. We want people to like always just kind of like, we don't want any surprises. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean like the standout brands, I mean, bear archery, vortex optics and the elk foundation all have been, Excellent. Really supportive. I mean, whether they're still, whether they're going to be as vocal as they maybe would have been, you know, like publicly, mm-hmm. that's probably toned back a little bit, but like still. Like, that's very cool. You know, doing what we were doing before, you know. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. and that's fine. I mean, the sphere that we work in and just marketing and content in general, it's just like, 
I mean, we love working with brands, but trying to kind of remove yourself from that to some extent is, Being independent is good. Of it. Mm-hmm. Just because it just changes from year to year. You could be the best filmmaker in the world. And I mean, like Sika, for example, like they just might be looking for content that just doesn't fit with you the best, you know? Right. And it's like, they love what you do. Yeah. There's only so many, so much of the pie that can get spread around. Right. And like, maybe there's a different marketing director that came in and yeah. he has his guys or, yeah, you know, I mean, it's just, it's you, really hard to, to it's fully a every year of like, how's yeah. it going to be? Yeah. yeah. Doing, uh, being able to do what you love to do, give create the content and the messaging that that really resonates with you make a difference in the world whatever your goals are being able to do that um and then also have the the resources the financial where ability to do it with without the need of of like the sponsorship kind of model it is a great place to be because it does give you a lot more freedom and flexibility and uh you know um and, and, and there's not those risks that, that, you know, as you, if you're monetizing and really helping with your brand with, with apparel and, you know, and, and selling some, your content, your film and all that, dude, you know, that really does help you, uh, when things, when the market shifts and things aren't doing well, mm-hmm. your core audience still values you yeah. and they still show that. Yeah. And it's not, you're not you're not like dependent on those external companies that, that may just decide, yeah, we're going a different direction now. Mm -hmm. You know, you're so much at their mercy. Yeah. uh, And it's not a, it's not the best place to be. No, no. And And it's it's like projects like this are a good way for people to like support. Yeah. A lot of different things. Yeah. I wish some more people would actually, you know, do that. Obviously they'd be competing with us, but, like the mindset for people isn't necessarily to go out and buy a DVD and support a film mm-hmm. for a majority of the people. I mean, it's yeah. like, a, like we said, you know, we have 60,000 people on our Instagram page. <laughs> How many actually are going to buy the DVD? Like, right. And yeah. so like th- those projects go a long way in, in allowing people to create the content and tell the stories that they want to tell without the brand telling it's, them it's what the story easy. is this year. It's not easy though. In my experience to, uh, um, you know, we live in a world of free content, Yeah. Mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and, and I'm guilty of it too. Like I love to get free, free content. And, and if it comes down to, I got to buy it, mm-hmm. it, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that for a select few oh, yeah. that I really value and appreciate and want to keep seeing them do what they do. But I almost have to be reminded of that. Like, Hey, this supports us so we can do more of this. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now I'll go buy X, Y, Z because yeah. I want to help them keep doing their thing but i mean it's just it's not natural though yeah not not today with so much that's free yeah and it's super difficult too because we almost do 100 percent do public land films Uh and like yeah like you're saying like private land like you i don't need any film permits it's super nice but at the same point it's like for us i mean i'm sure we'll probably do a private land hunt at some point but um it's kind of like we grew up or like started hunting on public lands and like it's super relatable and like Mm -hmm. we want to show like that challenge of public land hunting, not to mention even more so now with like public lands being, you know, challenged as far as like, are they staying? Are they selling them off? You know, yeah, just that whole thing. It's just, it's more of a process now. Like people are like, why don't you put out more videos, more films? Like, well, if I have to get 10 days of permits at like a hundred to 250 bucks a pop, plus like my insurance and stuff, it's like, and I don't have any sponsors. It's tough for me just oh, to yeah. go on my own I, and just go totally, do it. totally get that. Um, that's not easy. The uh, I I just think it, it's cool to see you guys. I, I mean, I've seen you. We're in your like home uh, turf here, yeah. uh, the mecca of uh, <laughs> Montana Wild. I mean, it's in your name, <laughs> and uh, and and there's just a lot of supporters I see just cruising by, seeing you guys uh, and supporting you and wearing your apparel and all that. And I found that I can sell way more hats and shirts. People are very willing to buy that. They they want to, but they're not going to buy a two ninety nine download of a film. Yeah, <laughs> and just like it just doesn't like translate uh or 9.99 or whatever it is it just i don't get the same response so yeah 
I think apparel, you know, it just tells me that they people want to support. They're just like, give me, give me a way to do that 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 I want to do. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I'm curious. I want to watch this, see how it goes. You'll have to tell me, you know, how the outlier does. Yeah. How this uh, film. I think it'll TV. be like once hunting season's over, we'll kind of have a good idea of like how it yeah. went. Yeah. Because we've never done it, and there's not really. There's not too many examples out there to like look at, like right. You know, like Donnie and the guys at Sick Man are gonna be like, "Yeah, we sold this many, and you know, like, here's how much we made." You know, like, which is fine. And and Donnie but, does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he sells DVDs. <laughs> you know, I mean, I remember so, when I first when I wanted to see like Rivers Divide, I was like, "Really, I gotta buy a DVD <laughs> and have it shipped?" What were we yeah. in like, like <laughs> this is like the '90s? What happened? Yeah. And uh, but evidently that model works. For, yeah. for Donnie, you mm-hmm. know, so. It works in other industries. It's just, <sighs> yeah. It and hasn't been done with like f- actual films. I mean, the Primos guys had really good long run and the Realtree guys with like the kind of older model. But back then you didn't have all this free no, stuff. you didn't. You, you know, couldn't you couldn't just, online, just YouTube and just go through hunting show up or, you know, archery elk. And there's like 50 of them to watch, right? Like. <laughs> And then different people putting out stuff constantly yeah. for free, and uh, so it'll it'll be interesting. I I hope people do uh, do go out and buy this for uh, sure. Especially, you know, I'm not one that's very patient and I'm very digital, so uh, I liked the fact that it was right there on your website. Mm-hmm. Go to Vimeo and download it. Boom! It's on my computer. I can just yeah. watch it instantly. Yeah, yeah, we would love to have it on itunes and other platforms but i mean people just don't realize i mean it's probably like 2500 bucks just to get that film on itunes oh i think it's more yeah i mean and like just the licensing for the music on the film was like four to five grand i know you know same here people don't realize it's good good music too (laughs) yeah and and a lot of times like that's the thing that kills me is when people make movies and then they go and get common licensing music that's just like (laughs) ghetto music i'm like you have this footage but the music is yeah. Every bit as important to me as the rest of it. And you guys did a great job. So thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, we're doing like a five percent back to RMEF for elk conservation. And hopefully yeah, I see uh, that you have five percent for conservation on here. Yeah, we're doing that and then we're on some of our apparel stuff we're doing three percent back for conservation as well. So like hopefully we can do something along those lines and maybe at some point it'd be awesome to actually take that like those funds uh-huh. and maybe just do like a, an actual spotlight on like where, what happened to those funds? You know, like did, did we get enough to like make, right. it, make a good difference or, you know, maybe try to show more of the process of just, you know, we gave some money and it was over with. I like seeing that too, by the way, you know, like Cameron Haynes and in, in mountain ops did that truck giveaway. I like actually seeing the video of the guy that gave the truck yeah, away to. Because so sure. many times it just feels like there's all these promotional deals and then people don't follow through or it doesn't happen. And it's mm-hmm. cool to see, you know, where it went. Mm-hmm. To see yeah. the, the the evidence of, of of the difference that they were able to make or that, that something actually happened that, that was promised. Yeah, I was talking to a guy last night about it. And he was a little frustrated because he feels like it's just a marketing play and there's no accountability to... Did they actually cut him a check at the end yeah. of the year? And or, often, like, if we can get enough money, like, from sales of the outlier, the 5% can go and tangibly work on a project, like, a specific, like, we went and removed, like, 50 miles of fence somewhere, you know, right. for elk habitat, or we did this, like, something tangible, like, oh, sweet, like, my money went to, like, put more elk out there, you know, yep. or, like, improve habitat. Or, well, it's just absolutely. cool to, like, have a peace of mind of, like, like your money for conservation is making a difference. I mean, yeah. on projects like this specifically yeah. where it's, it would be very cool if we can do that. So before we wrap up, like when is the next project coming out? <laughs> Too far out. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem. Like I get a taste for content and I'm like, now I got to wait a while. Well, we'll have a, uh, I have an archery mule deer hunt. That was actually was a sick of film that we'll be putting out next month in August. Yep, um, that'll be free from a couple of years ago. That'll be free. It's worth checking out. It was in the hunting film tour mm-hmm. as well. Awesome. Um, and we'll have some little bits and pieces coming out, but are like our main big projects, like the outlier. We'll be shooting one fishing related one here in 
the beginning of 2018, but then one for sure large project here this fall of 2017. And some other stuff kind of mixed in, but nice. Yeah, we'll probably have a fishing film that we'll try to sell next spring sometime. Yeah. We've been filming uh, some squallow fishing for the past like three or four years. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Those fishing films seem to get you guys into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This one will get us in big trouble. <laughs> We're uh, going to be spotlighting too much cool stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, any parting words before we close up? Anything you guys want to share? It was fun. Plug? Anything uh, you want to throw out and plug out there? Check out The Outlier if you get a chance. Yeah, definitely yeah. pick up The Outlier. And um, Definitely yeah. check out The check Outlier. Out. I watched it. Loved it. I'm going to watch it again. On my road trip, heading, heading to Portland later and uh, visit my family back there. And I'm going gonna, awesome. gonna to watch it a few more times. I, I I really, dude, you guys did a great job, man. It's a great film. People should support this. Thanks. Yeah. They really should. We'll yeah. keep promoting it. So follow us on Instagram. It's super easy to find us. Just Montana And Wild. there's an Instagram I, just for the film that and, shows uh, a lot of photos and background you know, on it. I mean, and I would say people go... go f- uh, follow Montana Wild. I can't vouch for their character, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I think they're probably all right. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> you let them make their um, own. Yeah, you know, make your own decisions. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm a little biased, perhaps, uh, av- ha- having met you and knowing a lot of people behind the scenes who yeah. know you, who are like, you need to re- you need to do a podcast with those guys because they're they're uh, stand up guys, and and it just isn't this isn't. Uh, it just isn't right. Yeah. And so, um, and after hearing that, you know, here we are. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys came on and I'm glad you guys were so open about it too. It oh. takes a lot to like, you know, yeah. some people just want to run from this stuff and you guys are extremely, extremely open with your story and that's cool. Yeah. You yeah. make it easy though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you started out with squirrel poaching, <laughs> it's easy to talk I mean, that's about a it. big deal. And then you come down to like what we were dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you've poached a squirrel, <sighs> it's, uh, it's easy to share your dirty You can relate with everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks for having us on. Thanks yeah, guys. Thanks a lot, Brian. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Stay gritty guys.